Jonathan Livingston Siegel. It's a movie that I love with all my heart, but it's also a forgotten movie and nobody ever talks about it these days. Most of the people of my generation, i.e. people under the age of 40, have never even heard of, much less read, the best-selling 1970 novella by Richard Bach. And even fewer people have seen the 1973 film adaptation, which was a critical and commercial flop. How good is the film? Depends on who you ask. Personally, I consider Jonathan Livingston Siegel to be one of my all-time favorite movies. But others, such as film critics, film historians, and even the author of the original book, have called it one of the worst movies ever made. I've spent several years researching the making of this fascinating film, and I once even attempted to shoot a documentary about it, but because of complicated legal reasons that I can't really go into, that never happened. Still, I've always felt there had to be some way for me to reintroduce this movie to the public. I've personally spoken to almost every cast and crew member still alive who was involved in the production of Jonathan Livingston Siegel, and I didn't want all my research to go to waste. So instead of a documentary, I give you this video, in which you'll hear about how Jonathan Livingston Siegel was turned into a movie in the first place. You'll also hear about its troubled production and the numerous lawsuits which damaged its initial theatrical release in 1973. And finally, you'll hear me make a case as to why I consider this film to be a masterpiece. Jonathan Livingston Siegel was produced and directed by Hall Bartlett, a man who had never made a successful movie in his life. Before Jonathan Livingston Siegel, Bartlett's films had included 1957's Zero Hour, in which Dana Andrews played an airline passenger who's forced to fly the plane after the pilots pass out because they ate fish for dinner. Yes, this is the movie which was infamously parodied by Airplane. Another one of Bartlett's earlier films was 1963's The Caretakers, in which Joan Crawford played a mental asylum warden who teaches karate to her nurses. These weren't bad films, but they weren't great either. They were strange and quirky, and I think Bartlett was hungry to do something great in his life for once. So, in the early 70s, he saw his chance when he read Jonathan Livingston Siegel and persuaded Richard Bach to sell him the film rights. As Bartlett himself later declared, I was born to make this movie. Richard Bach agreed to sell Bartlett the rights, with one unusual condition. He wanted to have all final cut privileges over the film. This meant that Bartlett could not legally release the movie in theaters until it was in a condition that Bach was satisfied with. However, when Bach finally saw the movie, he hated it. Bartlett had shot some scenes which allegedly weren't in the screenplay which Bach had written, and he had done this without Bach's permission. Bach wanted to prevent the movie from being released in theaters, but Bartlett told him that if he wanted to do that, he'd have to sue him. Sure enough, there ended up being a big lawsuit between the two men, and it ended with Bach having his name taken off the screenplay credits. I'm not exactly sure what Bach hated about the movie. I've asked him about it, but Bach has told me that he prefers not to discuss the movie. The subject is just too painful for him. Other sources have suggested to me that Bach didn't like the violent scenes in the movie, particularly the opening scenes where the seagulls are biting and blooding each other, and a later scene in which a hawk, voiced by Hall Bartlett, attacks Jonathan. Neither of these scenes are in the book, by the way. No, this is not your sky. This is my sky. My sky! Stay out! My sky! However, I've read Bach's screenplay, which is available at the Academy Archives in Beverly Hills, and the screenplay includes both the scene where the seagulls are biting each other, as well as the scene with the hawk. I also found an old interview from 1973 in which Bach and Bartlett initially seemed to be in agreement on some of these scenes, and there's no hint in the interview that Bach disapproves of them. So, I don't know, maybe Bach changed his mind about these scenes later on down the road. But Richard Bach wasn't the only unhappy crew member who sued Hall Bartlett. Another lawsuit was filed by songwriter Neil Diamond, who's actually one of a small number of people from the production that I still haven't had a chance to speak to. His managers just wouldn't let me talk to him. 
Diamond's soundtrack for the movie would go on to win a Grammy, but he was upset that Hall Bartlett edited some of his music out of the movie. And Diamond was also upset that composer Lee Holdridge wanted to share credit with him. Ultimately, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences ruled in Holdridge's favor, and justifiably so in my opinion. Diamond's songs, as wonderful as they are, could only do so much for the film on a musical level, and Holdridge's score is what finally ties all the music together. However, while I can understand Hall Bartlett's stubbornness in his legal battles with Richard Bach and Neil Diamond, there's one thing Bartlett did during production that I don't agree with, and that was his decision to demote associate producer Leslie Parrish to the role of researcher. I don't know why Bartlett did this, perhaps he just wanted all the producing credit himself, but in my opinion it was a mistake, because the truth is that Leslie Parrish was the associate producer. She was instrumental in selecting some of the shooting locations, and she's the one who hired cinematographers Jack Cuffer and Jim Freeman. During production, she also helped take care of the seagulls, which were kept in a room in a Holiday Inn in Carmel, California. There were so few women producing movies in the early 70s that I wish Hall Bartlett had treated Parrish with more respect, and that he'd given her the producing credit which she had so rightfully earned. When the film came out, it didn't do well at the box office, even though the book had been a huge hit. My guess is that fans of the book weren't interested in seeing the movie because the book was a purely internal experience, and no movie adaptation could possibly match what readers saw in their heads when they read the book. Maybe fans of the book didn't want to hear the Neil Diamond songs. Maybe the voice of James Franciscus wasn't the fans' idea of what Jonathan's voice would sound like. And it certainly didn't help that the author of the book hated the movie, which probably gave fans of the book second thoughts about seeing it. The movie was also trashed by the critics. In his review, Roger Ebert dismissed the original book by Richard Bach as banal, and then Ebert claimed that he walked out of the movie after the first 45 minutes. Although if you read his review, the scene where he claims he walked out of actually occurs only 21 minutes into the film. Jay Cox, who later became a screenwriter for Martin Scorsese, snorted that the film was bird droppings. Rex Reed confessed in his review that the film was not my cup of birdseed, although he did compliment Hall Bartlett for putting in the effort. Harry Medved and Randy Dreyfus included Jonathan Livingston Siegel in their book The 50 Worst Movies of All Time. However, this book also includes such titles as Richard Donner's The Omen and Sam Peckinpah's Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia, films which are now regarded as screen classics, so I think their extreme hatred for these films looks pretty silly nowadays. The reason why I'm going into such extensive detail about the bad reviews, commercial underperformance, and the troubled production of Jonathan Livingston Siegel is because I'm trying to give you an idea of just how lonely of a cause it is to actually defend this movie. Nobody has ever really stood up for it, and I think it's safe to say that it's not going to get any sort of significant reappraisal anytime soon. Lost. So why do I think this is a great movie? Well. I'll give you five reasons. Number one, the visuals. Visually, this film is astonishing. I mean, just look at it. It's unlike any other movie ever made. The way it so perfectly blends visuals and music together to provide an epic cinematic experience, it reminds me of what Stanley Kubrick achieved with 2001 A Space Odyssey. And while I don't know if 2001 directly influenced Jonathan Livingston Siegel or not, I do know that 2001 was one of Hall Bartlett's favorite movies. He said so in his book, The Rest of Our Lives. The cinematography in this film is jaw-dropping. All the gorgeous scenes shot on land were shot by director of photography Jack Cuffer, who was deservedly nominated for an Academy Award for Best Cinematography for his efforts. The nominees for Best Achievement in Cinematography are... Jack Kufa for Jonathan Livington Seagull. This, by the way, was one of two Oscar nominations the film ultimately received. The other was for its editing. The nominations for Best Achievement in Film Editing are... Frank P. Keller and James Galloway for Jonathan Livingston Seagull. The aerial sequences were shot by Jim Freeman, who was tragically killed in a helicopter crash years later. For this film, Freeman shot scenes which literally make you feel like you're soaring in the clouds right along with those seagulls as you watch the movie. 
I mean, seriously, I would love to watch this thing in an IMAX theater. By the way, here's some trivia about the seagulls. They were initially supposed to be trained by veteran bird trainer Ray Berwick, but Berwick got sick during production, and he didn't get along with Hall Bartlett either, so most of the bird training was actually done by Gary Jarrow. One of Jarrow's friends, assistant cameraman Stan McLean, helped out during the aerial sequences by tossing the seagulls out of the helicopter. Both Jarrow and McLean would go on to have very successful careers in the film industry. Number two, the music. The reason why this music works so well in this movie is because it tells the story all on its own whenever dialogue isn't needed. This is a lesson which all filmmakers can learn from. Sometimes, visuals and music are all you need. Number three, the voice acting. I love how James Franciscus practically whispers all of his lines as Jonathan. It's as if he's quietly amazed by everything he discovers on his journey. I've just flown up today, higher than we ever fly, far above the highest clouds. But you can see, I mean, you can see everywhere. For the first time in my life, I see where we live. Hal Holbrook has a menacing, booming voice as the villainous elder. You are henceforth and forever outcast! Juliet Mills plays Maureen, a character who wasn't in the book, but makes for a graceful, luminous companion for Jonathan in the afterlife. Didn't you say you know me from somewhere? I believe there were many somewheres. David Ladd, whose father Alan Ladd worked with Hall Bartlett on All the Young Men, brings out the youthful frustrations and anxieties of Fletcher Lynn Siegel. Damn the flock. I'll be outlaw all right. Outlaw like they never saw before. I'll make them so sorry. A lot of critics have dismissed the voice acting in this movie because they think the idea of sitting through a movie where seagulls talk like humans is absurd. I disagree. In my opinion, if you could sit through the talking animals and babe, which is also a great movie, you can certainly sit through these talking seagulls. Whenever the seagulls speak, they have important things to say, and the actors play their parts well. Number four, the story. It's a great story, and for the most part, it's actually pretty faithful to the book. The same structure is there. Jonathan does a little bit of flying. He's outcast from his flock because he doesn't obey their traditions. He flies off, sees the world, and dies. Is instructed in the afterlife then is reborn as a spiritual being and becomes a mentor to Fletcher before going off to help others. Again, the basic structure from the book is all there. It's just little things, such as the occasional changed character name or the occasional scene of violence which deviate from the book. Number five, the message. The message of this movie is that there's a real Jonathan Livingston Siegel who lives within us all. As Jonathan himself says in the movie, he's not special, he's not a god, he's not Jesus, he's just a simple seagull who likes to fly, and all he wants is to share that knowledge with others. What this means is that all of us are capable of doing extraordinary things in life. Jonathan is no more powerful than any of the rest of us. If he can do it, we can do it. I think that if you can believe the philosophies of George Lucas, who stated in Star Wars, we're talking the original trilogy here, by the way, that everyone is empowered and bound together by an energy field known as the Force, then you should have no problem believing the philosophy of Jonathan Livingston Siegel, that, that the, the way, way to, to find, find perfection, perfection and, and love, love is within, within us. us. So in conclusion, although the production of Jonathan Livingston Siegel was troubled, although hardly anyone saw it when it came out, although it got terrible reviews, Although all of these things are true, it is visually and musically astonishing, it has voice actors who do the material justice, it remains true to both the story and the profound message of the book, and it is a masterpiece. The time has come to reevaluate this beautiful film so that it can be rediscovered by a whole new generation. Thanks for watching.